Welcome to Good Life. I'm Dean Wilson. Great program today. Uh, Thomas Teig is with me. He's the president and CEO of Direct Relief International, uh, one of the largest uh, philanthropic nonprofit public charities in the world. They provide relief um, for a lot of people uh, in impoverished areas and responding to emergencies. It's a great organization. He's a great guy. Thomas Teig, Good Life is next. Welcome to Good Life. I'm Dean Wilson. So glad you joined us. You can always find us at goodlifetelevision.org. Um, it's been neat to see so many of you go there from all over the world. And there are a lot of great interviews, a lot of power clips. We, we kind of have the full form interviews and we break them up into power clips. And so there's a lot of great stuff. Hope you're inspired and uh, we're always happy to have you join us there and, and, he, and here. Uh, Thomas Teig is with me today. That's my guest. He's the uh, President and CEO of Direct Relief International. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about just kind of where you grew up and where, where your family and kind of where you started. Oh, boy. Okay. Um, well, I was born in Waukesha, Wisconsin. Oh. Uh, I was an Army brat, one of four kids. So we bopped around. I ended up um, starting school in Palo Alto. My dad was a West Point grad who was a career Army officer. So. Um, when he was going to ship out to Vietnam, uh, he went to do a little language training in Monterey, and my mom and dad were both from Chicago. And we had uh, my mom had a sister living in Palo Alto, which at the time was a small, sleepy college town. Hmm. So we moved there when my dad was uh, going to uh, go do a tour in Vietnam, and he was killed uh, in action. Wow! So I ended up I was six, so I think I was the youngest of four, and we. Tigs grew up in Palo Alto, so um, that's where I'm from, you know, but like any military family, <laughs> moved around well, from Wisconsin to Texas to Los Angeles, where my dad got an advanced degree at USC, I think, in engineering. So wow. I vaguely started to remember that when I was about four or five. Um, started kindergarten in, uh, in Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, and then ended up going through school and high school uh, in Palo Alto. So. Wow. And then you, you, you graduated from Berkeley. And then a JD from the Hastings Law School. Right. How did you end up in Washington D.C. on a Senate committee well, staff? You know, um, so my older sister, the, the smart one in the family, she had um, gone from graduate school at Berkeley to work back in Washington, and I think I went uh, ill-advisedly after taking the bar, passing it. I thought, you know, I should do the Peace Corps because if I don't do it now there's not going to be a chance you know I think it was pretty clear so I went and spent about two and a half years as a Peace Corps volunteer in Thailand Wow so what is a person who forgot everything they learned in law school but knows Thai <laughs> as an English <laughs> teacher what do they do go to Washington you know <laughs> and stay right. with your sister <laughs> and as it turned out um, the then senator senior senator from California was Alan Cranston huh. and he was the chairman of the Veterans Affairs Committee and he also was the longtime patron in the Senate of the Peace Corps. So mm -hmm. here I was, I had gone to college and law school on VA benefits because of my father, and I interviewed and yet they offered me a job as a, a lawyer on the Veterans Affairs Committee. Um, and my other hat was working for him on the Foreign Relations Committee, uh, dealing with the Peace Corps, so, which I knew nothing about. I was a Peace Corps volunteer. I knew nothing about like the legislative stuff, but it was, yeah. um, they told me, don't worry, no one really cares about it. No one votes for their member of Congress based on how their member of Congress votes on the Peace Corps. So it was great, but like no one cares about the Peace Corps. I love the Peace Corps. Right, so, right. Um, but it was, it was a great experience, you know, right out of really my first, you know, paid job. Peace Corps is a great job. But just seeing how it works and in, the, in Congress, I think just the, the policy and legislative process and mm -hmm. appropriations process it's fascinating you know and mm -hmm. if you're one of those people sitting around the ring behind the right. the real you right, know elected right. officials right. you get an inside peek so it was uh How just a great experience and a different time you yeah. know it was in the late 80s and it wasn't as divisive and right. you know veterans affairs uh was generally something that everyone agreed with they disagreed on specifics but there was no debate about obligation to people who'd served in the armed forces so right it was a great job in many respects and had that 
gave us that perspective, or me the perspective of how things work. And then on the Foreign Relations Committee, you know, because there was no other competition for the portfolio, learning a lot about the Peace Corps, how it is funded, how it works, the congressional oversight and appropriations. So that led me thereafter to go right, down to the Peace Corps. Yeah. That's going to be my next question. You spent seven years uh, in executive leadership of the Peace Corps. So you went straight from Washington to, to the Peace Corps? Yeah, well, yeah, Peace Corps headquarters is in Washington, D.C. Okay, so, okay. you know, from a Peace Corps volunteer to being a lawyer in the Senate, uh, which I was grossly unqualified for, but you, you learn you <laughs> learn or sink or swim, and then back to Peace Corps headquarters um, about five years after I'd been a volunteer. So it was, I had wow. the orientation of what it was like to be in the Peace Corps and, you know, Unlike something like the military that where there's respect for rank and position, the Peace Corps is totally inverted. The, the higher you are in a position, uh, the more of an idiot everyone else thinks you are in the Peace Corps. <laughs> so I thought, uh, you know, and I, and I knew that. So I was a suit all of a sudden from uh, Washington. And that was, um, but I, you know, my heart was with the volunteers. It was, it was a great job. And What do you love about the Peace Corps? Well, I think it really is, it's sustained. I think it's the, it's kept wonderfully free of like partisanship mm -hmm. you know it's something that uh, is relatively small as a federal agency um, but it was kind of this very altruistic idea in mm -hmm. during the Cold War how do you not have you know countries right. which have natural tensions for strategic reasons much more so than people from countries you know right. ha have similar tension between them they just don't know each other so I think that idea and the program that you know was started during the Kennedy administration and sustained, it's really been a terrific source of great goodwill. I think it's done good work, promoted a lot of, fostered a lot of understanding. You know, you're just working there. You're yeah. there to do a job and you live with people. You have to learn the language. And I think over time, it's really, it's one of those things that, you know, it, it's hard to capture the immediate value, the return on that investment but I just read a story recently in the New York Times about a, a woman who'd served in the Peace Corps in Korea 30 or 40 years ago. And the, the, the government of Korea, um, South Korea, you know, s extended a special package when COVID broke out to every person who'd ever served in the Peace Corps. Really? Saying, thank you, you were there. <laughs> you know, South Korea was a poor country uh, for many years. Now it's a rich country, but they didn't forget. And that wow. sort of that, it's like, what made you who you are, it's probably one of your grammar school teachers, and right. they don't know that. And right. I think the Peace Corps has got fruit. a lot of that dimension. Yeah, yeah the fruit kind of can be unseen or seen much later. Yeah. Or sometimes you never see it. But, but it still does attract, you know, that um, people who are kind of wired that way. Yeah. There's an opportunity for them to serve in a way that um, is work, it's desired by other countries, um, it doesn't have any else you know, ulterior motive, yeah. but, and it's been a terrific source of, you know, for me, I think it really changed the direction of this meandering path I had been on. Yeah. Um, and I think it's been true for probably the 200,000 other people who've served in the Peace Corps yeah. over 50, 50 years, yeah. Wow. Um, I want to get into the organization mm -hmm. you lead, Direct Relief, and I want to start that conversation by talking about a man that probably not a lot of people have heard of, William Zinbin. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, it was, this was kind of my morning reading today. It was <laughs> fascinating. But, so in 1945, William Zinbin, an Estonian immigrant who had amassed significant wealth in pre-war Europe, began sending thousands of relief parcels containing food, clothing, and medicines to relatives, friends, and former employees who were rebuilding their lives in the aftermath of World War II. Having witnessed the impacts of unche unchecked power, Zimden dedicated his life's fortune to the oppressed, shunning the faci fascism that had caused him to flee Hitler's Europe for his life. He established the William Zimden Foundation on August 23, 1948 as a California-based nonprofit corporation. Um, and then it goes on. And he, and he passed away in 1951 and then Somebody else took it over, and then it became Direct Relief right. International. I think it's amazing what one person can do. When, when I read this, I, I, it got me thinking, you know, is, a lot of us think when we're dreaming or we're mm -hmm. thinking about an idea, like, well, you know, I can't, 
I can't do it or it's not going to make a difference. Or, right. And here's a guy, one guy, and he had right. some money. Yeah. But one guy who decided just with his family, friends, relatives, former employees, he was going to start sending relief packages. Right. That decision to do that became the organization you lead today, which right. is unbelievably impactful all over the world, rescuing people. But I just think, I just think it's fascinating, you know, what one person can Absolutely. do. Absolutely. Now, I, you know, you predated uh, me by decades. I'm not that old yet, but, um, <laughs> but I think the story is one that it's. I've thought a lot about it because you know, an immigrant, a war immigrant refugee, <coughs> who fled. I think famously, he the reason he fled was because he, uh, he was a prominent person. And I think it was reported that someone, uh, I guess Hitler was trying to recruit industrialists. It was a National Socialist Industrialist Party, and. Mr. Zimden said publicly, well, what a fool this guy, I mean, you know, he's like, yeah, right. a, you know, which was absolutely the right historic call, but got him on the, the Hitler the wanted hit. to kill him, didn't yeah. he? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So I think that's why he fled. But I think that um, trying to channel in, in, in retrospect, I think he was a, a business person who was caught up in the events of history, saw the devastation and decided to do what he could with his own money. And that orientation, this was before the, even the term corporate social responsibility existed. Philanthropy wasn't as evolved as it is today with a lot of norms and things. So I think he did what he knew. I mean, he, he looked at people and bombed out Europe and what they needed, they could not afford. I mean, the economy yeah. was wrecked. So I think the impetus to help um, was a natural one but the way he did it was different. I mean, he did it as a business person and he invited other business people to join. You know, I'm putting in my own money. Yeah. Hey, look, these people need what you make. You're not going to lose a sale if they can't buy it anyway. And you're at scale. So yeah. you're the best person to participate because your marginal cost is lower than anyone else's. Mm -hmm. And so it was a brilliant call. Right. And I think how do you do something at, in the most efficient way for yeah. humanitarian purposes? And he, he was a guy who kind of figured it out naturally. And um, obviously it, the roots of current direct relief go back to that. How do you think about um, what is it you're trying to do and who would you like to make, you know, extend an invitation to, to join if they want. Yeah, right. Um, no politics, no religion, and kind of that basic humanitarian uh, impetus and trying to do it well. I think he was using his own money, so there was a desire to you know, not waste it, which is yeah. a, good, a good one to remember <laughs> right. for all of us. So I think those kind of things were baked in at the outset. And we still, I think a lot of them are still core characteristics of the organization today. Wow. The mission of Direct Relief is a humanitarian aid organization active in all 50 states and more than 80 countries with a mission to improve the health and lives of people affected by poverty or emergencies without regard to politics, religion, or ability to pay. And you know, and you and 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 you've you've led this organization for twenty years and I was it's impressive the recognition you all receive in terms of how you run your organization. You're in the top ten of charity navigators, eight thousand nonprofits, whatever it is they evaluate your number four. And and so it's well run. Um, which is, I think, a, a credit to you. But tell us a little bit about, a little bit more about it, kind of the culture that you've built at, at Direct Relief and where your heart is right now. Yeah, I, well, I think that, you know, the a, approach is one that, as I mentioned, it's, it's sort of government-like in its purpose. I mean, Direct Relief and every nonprofit only exists for the public benefit. Yeah. So that, that's what I brought into kind of a sense of what that meant. And what are the ethics of when you're conducting yourself in the public sphere for the public benefit? That's what government does, I think. Um, so we government like in in purpose, but business like historically in function, mm -hmm. in approach and thinking. And it's strange to me, you know, I've so internalized that it's often seen as so different, and that's just a fiction. I mean, I think if you if it's in some, you know the old saying if it's uh, it's worth doing, it's worth doing right. Yeah, um, right. That's particularly true when it's the right thing to do. You really, right. if, it, if the cause is important, do it well. Yeah. You use the money well. There's a lot of 
I think, um, some causes are so compelling, um, deeply compelling, that um, you can be blinded by how important it is and forget that you know, if, if it's that compelling, do it right. Yeah, right. Because there's a lot of work that's not done well under a banner of a righteous cause. But yeah. just because the banner is righteous doesn't mean the work under that banner is being done well. And I think that's, I think, trying to embrace both of those dimensions. Just do it well, do it right. We know the purpose is the right one, but just do your work right. on behalf of the people. I've often thought that nonprofits shouldn't be called nonprofits. I've often right. thought they should just be called tax exempt businesses, yeah. tax exempt organizations. Right. <laughs> I mean, it be, because the, it seems like that nonprofit mantra sometimes can lead people to think that it's not run efficiently, and right. a lot of them aren't. Right. Which, it, in effect, hurts the mission. I mean, yeah, it and it breeds cynicism. It's sort of, right. you know, you see it in government too. I think, you know, uh, unfortunately, I think, no. you know, all, all the, <laughs> well, you know, but I think it's just the times we're in. I think the, yeah. the, you project these most important functions for societies on governments, and if they don't do it or they do something dumb or don't spend the money well, people say, you know, I don't want to, yeah. I don't want to put more money behind that. Right. The cause is important. I'm with you on principle. I'm not with you in practice. And that's something that it's yeah. really important for nonprofits at public charities that only exist if people want them to exist. Right. I mean, it's not mandated or required that direct relief exists. It's it only exists if people believe it should. Yeah. And that's a very good reminder, you know, yeah. for us to make sure that we're doing right by the, the mission and we're doing right by the people who fund it. Yeah. And, you know, I, I have a big title, but I actually am a staff member and report to a very good board of directors who are deeply experienced, deeply committed, and um, unfortunately, smarter and, you know, more experienced than I am. Right, <laughs> right. questions are <laughs> very, always very intense and appropriately so, but it keeps us on our toes on the staff for sure. I was reading this also, since your arrival at, at Direct Relief, uh, the organization's provided cash grants of more than $120 million and furnished more than $8 billion in essential medicines, equipment, and supplies. Mm -hmm. um, if you were, and I'm sure you do this all the time, if you're introducing Direct Relief for the first time to somebody who's never heard of you, which probably is not a lot of people at this point because it's a well-known organization, but if you're introducing it for the first time, how do you introduce, what's your elevator speech, or how do you introduce what you do? Oh, I, I push the stop button on the elevator, and I start <laughs> <clears throat> in 1948. It's about an hour. Um, well, no, I think it's, you know, it's a humanitarian uh, medical organization that works in all 50 states and around the world with a basic model of making sure that people who need but can't afford care have access to it. Um, so we, you know, there's a whole lot of things and different features, but I think what has evolved uh, direct relief functionally, I mean, the purpose is humanitarian health. That's why we do it. The function we perform, there's a lot of things you can do under, to advance humanitarian health services for people in need. We looked at it, um, it the organization evolved from it used to actually send trainers, sort of like a Peace Corps model. There would be doctors and nurses who would go to both provide services and train. And they realized in, in, in the 1970s, the only time the people that they would already trained work is when a team came with stuff. Uh. So I think then it evolved to like, how do you make sure that the investment in the people who have been trained doesn't just lie fallow. They need tools to diagnose and take care of patients and they're expensive. So I think a ma the material support component really became the central focus and um, trying to encourage the corporate sector and other folks, how do you make sure that these places where there's not a strong business case to engage because there's not a lot of money, there's a strong human case. Mm -hmm. And how do you in invite people to participate and do it in a way that would instill confidence in the people providing medi donating medications or vaccines or supplies to direct relief um, and so that's what we've really tried to do, be absolutely um, as good as a dis commercial distributor is, um, which is heavily regulated, a lot of licensing. We had to build a giant new facility to do that. It should be as good for people who are poor. Mm -hmm. It ought not to right. be a, a different standard. So a lot of what we do is actually, you know, 
identifying needs and gaps, trying to seek support to fill those needs in the realm of medication supplies and vaccines, and then providing them free of charge with integrity to make sure they get to the right people who are licensed appropriately, have the right ethics, and are taking care of people in a non-discriminatory way. Uh, that's wonderful. How, how, who's your typical funder or donor or, I mean, I'm sure you have all range of partners who participate, but yeah, I think a lot of so many of the, the healthcare products are donated directly from the manufacturers. So we have the great benefit of, you know, 70 years of working with the corporate sector. Um, and we're, I think, the main humanitarian channel for contributed medical products in the world. I mean, so wow. we, we have the same accreditation and licensing um, that the major commercial distributors in the United States have. And, and we, are in an advanced country with a lot of regulatory compliance requirements. So we have all the same things um, because the companies require that. And so the companies typically, manufacturers provide the material support. The financial support comes from our board, uh, members of the general public, some companies, and, uh, but mostly individuals, you know, yeah. and who find us. And as we've been more visible um, during things like COVID, you know, we haven't sent out a solicitation for requests in three years. Really? And during those three years, we've received more support than ever before. And I think that the takeaway for me has been, most of the time, you know, what people hear about or from a nonprofit is one thing, we need your money. And we, we didn't have a lot of money to throw at, at that kind of marketing and campaign solicitation effort, so we thought, that's strange, that's the only time, they, they might not know you and you're introducing yourself, hi, I need money, you know, and, <laughs> and intruding in their mail, right? So I think we've, uh, we've flipped it entirely and said, let's always make it about the work. People are smart and, and they're kind of jaded. So if we do a good job, let's make sure that we report it. So we hired some journalists to report it. Um, we have a good website. You can subscribe on Google News or Apple News. We're an authorized news source on Go Google Apple and Bing. Oh, really? And that has no solicitation. It can't have any solicitation. It will get thrown off. And that has been a real source of people finding us, including people like, you know, the, the gaming industry, net, um, online gamers, mm -hmm. people who play that. They found us. They liked us. And they, there's tens of thousands of people who just are really smart. You know, it's this broad community that I wasn't aware of until it, it came on. That's been a terrific source of wow. energy and financial support, but just um, people who feel that they have a way to participate in something, an event unfolding, whether it's COVID or a hurricane or uh, a typhoon. And that's been just terrific for us to see. Wow. Um, well, let's talk about COVID real mm -hmm. quickly. We don't have a lot of time, but I, but I wanted to um, ask you about that. So, and I'm, I'm interested just kind of in how you guys operate in general. Like, so. You, you found out about COVID probably, what, January before that? Yeah, it was an interesting, you know, our first signals were from China itself. We were asked to help in Wuhan um, when they oh, had the Wuhan. outbreak in Wuhan by, from the Chinese. There was a Chinese um, a guy up in San Francisco whose family was from Wuhan. And so they were really worried. They, they had an outbreak. It was kind of reported. We're always concerned. We've been, we were involved in a big way in the Ebola response. And so uh, we also had, <laughs> have been manufacturing our own PPE for the last several years, like the N95 masks you hear about. Yeah. Well, because of really fires in California, and it's often a required protective year, we started manufacturing our own. So we had a NIOSH approved N95 direct relief model that we had made in China. And so we understood. Huh. The importance of having PPE, we have we stockpile things for fires and other emergencies. We were shocked that we were asked because, you know, we're getting supplies from China. That's where right. we have it manufactured. Um, but we said, of course. I mean, it's really important to jump on this as fast as you can. So if we can do it, we weren't sure if it was going to work. Um, but FedEx that we work with extensively has a big presence in China, 8,000 employees. They said, if you can, if you have the material and they need it, we'll make it happen. So we did a series of immediate pushes of material into Wuhan. 
Wow. Um, and then as it started, we were concerned about what would happen if and when it came to the States. And when it did, we said, okay, you're in far better shape. We've got to reserve what we have for what we think is going to be a very bad situation here. So uh, because we work in all 50 states, we have daily kind of contact with thousands of facilities uh, online that order and, or seek requests from direct relief. So we tried to make sure our you know, sensitivity was high. We started, the first case was in Seattle, second case was uh, I think up in the Bay Area, and we were pushing stuff out. We were concerned and remain concerned um, about the people who were the least fortunate to begin with. You know, uh, Dean, what we've learned is that every emergency brings on a whole new set of problems on top of the ones that already existed. Right. These don't go away. And the people who suffer the most always, whether it's a hurricane or a tornado, who have the hardest time dealing with it, the hardest time bouncing back after, are the people who have the hardest time before. It's kind of, yeah, right, so right, right. that's who we work with, that's who we identify and support on an ongoing basis. So that's where we really look when there's an emergency and, and what we've been doing uh, ever since, trying to make sure that those frontline facilities, the nonprofit community health centers um, are well equipped, that their workers are protected and they can keep functioning. And, you know, it's just gotten so big in a global pandemic. Um, we've just been scrambling to do as much as we can privately um, based on the capabilities we have um, to make sure that there's a private complement to the obviously large public spending that's going on. Right. And we can move fast. I mean, you know, that's the, I think government may move slow, but they have scale. And when they, you know, when you have scale and you get the big wheels turning, they go really far, really fast. Nonprofits like ours tend to be smaller. We can move faster, um, but scale is an issue. So we've been trying to scale and maintain that zippiness that we've always had, which is important in emergencies. Right. Wow. Has it been, I mean, I, maybe it just feels this way because it's 2020, but has it been like worse <laughs> in the world in the last, I mean, <laughs> I mean, if the last, I mean, when you started 2020, compare it, or 20, 2000, mm -hmm. compared to kind of the last few years in terms of crises and humanitarian challenges. Yeah. You know, the natural disasters are, are objectively, <clears throat> they're more frequent, more intense, and more destructive. I mean, over the past 20 years, that, that's just a fact. I mean, the, the world's you know, the historically largest, uh, most devastating hurricanes, um, you know, they've happened, uh, fires in California, the Western United States, Australia. Um, but I think in terms of global conflicts, major wars, I think it's been, you know, not the, the World War too. I mean, thankfully, I think. Right. So there's been such progress. I think the rapid acceleration of the business community, we have figured out a lot in the past 20 years. I mean, just the mainstreaming of all technology, how we interact with each other and conduct businesses. Um, that's allowed us to do a lot more faster and more efficiently as, as well as any business or anyone else can. So in many ways, it's gotten worse in terms of the impacts of natural disasters, mm -hmm. um, but we have more tools to address them with right. now. Right. And I think it's, um, so it's a definitely a mixed bag and 2020 has just been, you know, <laughs> let's have a global pandemic, the worst in 100 years, plus the worst hurricane season ever, plus historic flooding in Central America with, the, you know. The fires. It's, uh, yeah, it's yeah. Um, the fires. Yeah, yeah. it's, it's, um, it's, it's a new a scale of, yeah, no, it's, I, I'm not sure what, I went 10 years of Catholic school, I think I, I, I could describe it in ways that wouldn't be appropriate, but it's, uh, um, yeah, it's a humdinger for sure. We have one minute. Is this rewarding work for you? Are you, do you, are you rewarded just kind of personally by the kind of work you do? Yeah, I mean, I, it's, it's hard to even, there's a lot of reasons for skepticism in the world, a lot of reasons for cynicism in the world. It's impossible in my job to be cynical when the only people I meet routinely are people who are just trying to do something good for someone else yeah. on their own. It's not, they're not required. Yeah. It's not because we're clever marketers or we haven't tricked anybody. So that is such a great reminder that, you know, yeah. this great human quality that distinguishes our species. So it's deeply rewarding and get to meet and terrifically dedicated people and work with wonderfully motivated people and including our board who are, don't have to do it either and are the embodiment of applying their wealth and knowledge in life 
right. to a cause greater than themselves. Yeah, and so in some ways, you kind of see the best of humanity. Absolutely. Which is amazing. And this is a great way to finish. The program's called Good <laughs> Life. We talked about all the disasters. We'll finish on a good note. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Dean. And thanks My for pleasure. all the work you've done. Great, Absolutely. Great career. And we'll see you next time.